Hello and welcome to Voices Unheard, produced by Unicorns Live. I'm your host, Jessica Samuels, and thank you for joining us as once again tonight we bring you underrepresented voices and stories in our community. And my guest tonight is... My name is Tony Boot. I am the mayor of Summerland, and I'm going to be talking tonight about what it's like growing up uh, being a person of colour in the Okanagan Valley, and also what it is like to be a black female in local government. Yeah, lots to talk about mm -hmm. there. Before we get started, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we live, work and play on the ancestral, traditional and unceded territory of the Okanagan Nation and Silix people. Thank you to the Canada Kelowna Hotel and Conference Centre for hosting us here this evening. We'd also like to say thank you to Castanet Media and Kelowna Pride as the show sponsors. Before we get started with Tony, I would like to let uh, everybody know who's watching. Thank you for watching, first of all, and those of you who are joining us here in, at the Canada Hotel tonight, that we're super excited to have Tony on the show, and we're going to talk about being a person of colour in the Okanagan, in Canada, this day and age, a woman in politics, a person of colour in politics. We will not be touching upon the incidents surrounding the sale of the Confederate bandana at the dollar store in Summerland. That story has been well covered in the media, and if anyone would like information on it or more details or get brought up on the details, I encourage you to do a Google search and check it out. Okay, so moving on. Thank you for joining yeah. us, Tony. Thank you. Um, you were elected mayor of Summerland in 2018, correct? Prior yes. to that, you were on city council. Right. Did you have, when was the first inkling that you knew you wanted to be in politics? Uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I had been approached several times in probably the 10 years leading up, but I also was um, running my own business then. Mm -hmm. uh, I founded and operated Grasslands Nursery yeah. in Summerland, and there was not possibly enough time to be doing both. Then I got to a point where it was time to sell the nursery and I made the decision in 2014 that that was the time that I would, uh, you know, make my foray into politics. And so the, the nursery actually had a, had a buyer that fell through, but then, you know, somebody that I taught at the college that also worked for me, uh, she, she and her husband now uh, decided that they wanted to buy the nursery and so they took over it in uh, 2015. So I was, you know, kind of, uh, it was very good timing because of course the nursery closes for the winter season mm -hmm. and doesn't reopen until about April and that's when they took the, the uh, business over. So it was perfect timing and in 2014 I um, won a seat on Summerland Council and then that was that was my start right you did one term as council and the next term as mayor prior yes. to that had in summerland's history had had mm -hmm. there been a, a person of color any gender man woman um on council or or in the mayor chair um i i don't think so okay certainly not in the mayor's chair there there have been women that preceded me uh, women mayors, but um, not not a female mayor of color. What in, what inspired you then? I mean, you, you you said that the timing was good because you were ready to sell, and you mm -hmm. had you know eventually some buyers. You had people approach you, but you said people had approached you for for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. What was it? Was there any one incident or a couple that said, "Yeah, now's the time to do it." Um, I, I think probably the biggest thing was in the year 2014, there was a decision by the then council to move, um, well, we called it the land swap, so to move uh, a couple hundred hectares of arable land out of the ALR and then to move in a a bit more than that actually, of not so arable land that previously had been moved out of the ALR because it was not as arable as it might have been. 
and there was a big, um, I guess maybe uproar <laughs> in the community <laughs> about that. Okay. And I have long been um, a supporter of agriculture. Part of the work that I did with Grasslands Nursery was, um, you know, sustainable food production, and I taught it at the college. And so, um, I grew up in a large family, and we had probably two acre garden. So I learned all about that and, you know, treating the soil and all of that. So this was a real affront to me personally for the council to be considering that. And many in the community felt the same way. And so that really was um, the catalyst, I guess, to get me to step forward and, mm -hmm. you know, Put, your Put myself out there. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever have second thoughts as you were going through that initial process as running for a council? You, you, obviously, you had this burning passion in terms of, of doing right and doing good according to agriculture and, and uh, what is good for the community, that you would be able to have a voice or make a difference. Did you have those seeds of doubt in those moments where you're just like, oh, what can... What really can I achieve? Well, you hear, um, especially people in local government, you hear this a lot, especially if they've grown up in the community where they're, you know, serving the community is, I've, I've received so much from the community, it's time to give back. And I, lo I love living in Summerland. I was only away for about 12 years when I was going to school and working at the coast and uh, made the decision to come back to Summerland uh, once our first son was born and then had the second son and it just seemed to be the right the right place to uh, raise the kids. And then um, once I made the decision, I temporarily changed my mind because that was the first year that they went from a three-year term to a four-year okay. term. And I thought, four years, that's <laughs> such a long time. Uh, but then I thought, well, four years, you know, it's going to go by fairly quickly, and it certainly did. And uh, that, there was one other time where I was not feeling that maybe this wasn't the right decision. But I know that others were hoping that I would change my mind and not run. And I think you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so uh, I, um, was, I was out away. And when I uh, got home, my, my husband, Steve, <laughs> said, uh, while you were out, uh, I had a visit from the police. As it turns out, someone had decided to change my lettered sign at Grasslands um, to something that was pretty awful. Um, not only uh, to females, but also to a um, person with my color of skin, to black people. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything about it. The person that I don't even know who it was. I have my suspicions on who it was. Suspicions probably isn't the right word here. Um, I think I know who it was that reported it to the police, and they um, wanted, they asked the police to open a hate crime file, and then all of that. But right away, people were shocked, mm. and I got a lot of people contacting me that were saying that they were shocked. How could anything like that happen in Summerland? And I also got the question, so um, are you going to pull out of the race? There were, I think, 15 or 18 of us running for the six council seats. And I said, well, clearly whoever has done this doesn't know me because that just makes me all the more keen on getting a seat on council and gaining a voice in the community. Uh, so I, I carried on and ended up um, topping the polls and that was the start of my political life. Right. That incident that you're talking about, I mean, I don't know if anyone can ever really be prepared for it. 
were you shocked or surprised mm -hmm. at the overt nature? Um, I wasn't shocked because, you know, racism has been part of my life. Um, I was, I wasn't surprised either. I was really disappointed mm -hmm. that somebody would think it was okay to, you know, to try and do this and, you know, to try and get me out of the race. And, um, you know, when it comes to um, words, uh, I, I'm not I'm not easily offended mm -hmm. and I learned from a very young age mm -hmm. you know just to you know pretend that you can't hear them and and walk away so um, yeah I, I was disappointed then and um, disappointed you know whenever whenever it comes up in the community. Um, I, I have to say that with this most recent racist incident against a uh, family of color mm -hmm. uh, in Summerland, um, again, that was fairly, well, that was very overt. And again, the, the hate crime team is working with the Summerland detachment on that file. Um, I again was disappointed but this time I was disappointed that there still was so many people that were shocked. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, what, six years ago? Mm -hmm. Less than that. And now it's like, oh, I'm so shocked that this, is, this has happened. And we need to move from, from shock to uh, understanding and then on to pushing back against these kinds of events. Yeah, I'm always interested in the individuals who are shocked because uh, Summerland, much like Kelowna, is uh, a highly white population. Mm -hmm. And so who is shocked by the racism? Is, is it the white people? Because mm. they wouldn't be experiencing it. And, and, and we can talk about racism or any other uh, term or arena where underrepresented voices or yes. underrepresented populations, I can't speak towards discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. I could easily say there's none. I don't, how would I know I don't experience it? S do you have comments on that? Like who is surprised in the community? Are, uh, well, this particular family, the parents were very surprised. Mm -hmm. It hadn't happened to them. They and the family, uh, the, in case people don't yeah, know, sorry. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a South Asian Yes, yeah, yes, family. an Indo-Canadian family yeah, that's Indo been here over three decades. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has, they have learned, the parents have since learned that their children, they have three children, uh, all grown now, uh, also experienced racism when they were in school, not as overt as what we saw there. And I think that that's why uh, people, and yes, um, white people, I think that's one of the reasons why they are so shocked, is because this is, this was very public, just like what happened to me in 2014. This was very public and very in your face. And people don't want to acknowledge necessarily that there is this going on in their lovely little community. Mm -hmm. And so when it's really out there and in your face, you're shocked. But if you, um, when, when people think, I now and I'm, I'm just speaking from my observations, that um, racism is something like uh, what we saw against the Leckie family, mm -hmm. or racism is, um, you know, burning crosses or wearing hoods or um, 
what happened to Mr. Floyd with the, mm -hmm. with the police. Um, people think of that as racism. Mm -hmm. They don't think of all the other things that for, uh, for me, for a person of color, um, are not nice to experience. And that goes to things like, um, you know, like jokes or um, people thinking that they're being funny by saying something, um, uh, cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. I am not, I, I'm not afraid for people to uh, ask me questions. I'm not sure that it's my responsibility to educate people, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if people genuinely want to learn, um, this, is why, this is why our council has said, let's have these conversations about racism. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn, then you can come out and join us in the conversations. And if you don't, if you don't care or don't understand or you know, whatever, then there's no there's no pressure on you to to do that. How are the what are these conversations? How are they coming about with with council and the public? Well, um, we have directed staff to to work on that, and their their goal was to have the first conversation towards the end of August. Mm -hmm. uh, it's as you can imagine, it's a little trickier now with the pandemic and uh, getting the technology that's required so that. People can participate, but still feel safe to participate. And there's going to be uh, almost certainly some um, uncomfortable bits to this, mm -hmm. uh, really as people start to understand and come to the realization that maybe they have, you know, unknowingly, um, really just from if I could use the word, you know, ignorance, um, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So this is the opportunity for people that want to know and want to do better and want to stand up and speak against racism to actually take the actions that are necessary to be able to do that. How would you describe Summerland? Would you just Describe it as a racist community. <laughs> Put mm -hmm. you on the spot. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you're because not putting me on the spot. No. <laughs> well, it's interesting that a, a council would take, I think, some pretty significant steps. And, and congratulations to council for doing that. Mm -hmm. There, there must be something more that had said, okay, we've got to do one thing more, what, a step further. I mean, because. You know, you, you have a person of color as, uh, as mayor. I mean, you're already the, you know, a few steps ahead of some. I mean, we do as well in Kelowna. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so we would assume that there's going to be some kind of fostering of understanding as well. This is an extra step. Why, why was there felt that there's a need for this extra step? These extra steps? I think that... Yeah, first of all, I'll answer your first question. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think Summerland is a racist <laughs> town. I said that a number of times, uh, you know, back in 2014 and certainly in the last two or three weeks. I don't think Summerland is a racist town, but there are elements of racism in it. And you can get, you can get that anywhere because society is made up of a whole, you know, group of diverse perspectives. Um, and although culturally, Summerland is not very diverse, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, I would say it's over 70% white, um, maybe more than that. Um, but I don't think that Summerland is a racist town. I don't, um, I, I would never, I would never describe it as that. Okay. Um, as far as uh, council taking this next step, I think that um, 
when they saw the outpouring of the by the community, hundreds of people showed up for a, a parade to support them. Um, I think that when council saw that, and when council um, started receiving, and this was this was by request of staff if I would send along all of the correspondence that I got, both, um, you know, kind of neutral, um, not supportive complaints and supportive, that I uh, got either to my personal email address or um, to my mayor's address. Most of it came through to my mayor's address. Then they put that into a Dropbox so that all of council could get a better understanding of what the issue uh, is, to what degree mm -hmm. it is in our town. Now, a lot of the, um, maybe half of the correspondence that I got uh, was not from locals, you know, Summerland, Penticton, Kelowna area. A lot of it was from outside of, um, the Okanagan Valley, some some in the United States even, I got a lot of um, a lot of telephone calls from mayors all all throughout the province, and um, from um, members of the caucus, uh, provincial government, and uh, I, I would say the the ones that were most impactful for me and for council, especially the young mothers. We have two young mothers on our council, both the same name. Both have two youngsters. Uh, I think that the letters that um, I started to get from wherever it happened to be, that were from parents of adopted children or parents that um, were, it was a mixed marriage, and they had children of color. That really impacted, um, that really impacted council, and most more specifically, uh, myself, because I'm also a mother, although my children have grown, but uh, these young mothers that are on our council, it's like, do we really want this to be something that our children have to talk about. Mm -hmm. And when we started getting uh, correspondence from people that were parents or grandparents, some of the things were, some of the correspondence was um, signed by, you know, mom and dad and then the names of their children. Uh, that was really impactful. And I think that that perhaps was where council said, whoa, um, we, need, we need to do something about this. And uh, the, day, the day of the Leckie incident, um, myself and two councillors went to the family because we all, we all know them. And it was that day that the two other councillors that were there, they came to me and said, um, what can we do as a council? What can we do for this family? And then it went beyond this family once we started getting that correspondence in, um, just standing up against it. How much of this do you think has to do with timing? I mean, you mentioned George Floyd, we know Breonna Taylor prior to that, and countless others mm -hmm. uh, prior to that. But really, the, this movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter, and the, the justice for George, the justice for Breonna, um, how much do you think that influenced these series of events? So certainly the community's response to what happened to the Lecky family in Summerland, mm -hmm. and then subsequently council and staff's response. Um, I, I think it's... I think it's a number of different things uh, that has that have all it kind of like a perfect storm, mm. and certainly what we have been seeing in the states 
and what has moved into Canada with kind of the revival of the Black Lives Matter movement. But I think that maybe even more than that, I mean, certainly that is for, um, that's focused on, on black individuals. But I think that maybe something else that has come in and given this a lot of momentum is uh, a couple of years ago with the UNDRIP, you know, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of mm -hmm. Indigenous People, um, with the federal government, and then more recently with our own provincial government saying we need to get started on reconciliation. And the work that we at local governments have been doing uh, throughout the province in working together with First Nations governments and uh, hereditary chiefs at times, I think that there is more of an understanding that uh, a lot of this, um, well, in the States, it's it particularly um, black people and how the government, and I don't mean this particular administration, um, but governments throughout time, uh, have mm, impacted the rights of black people. Mm -hmm. And then in Canada, of course, it's much more the indigenous people. And again, it's the, it's the federal or the national government mm -hmm. that kind of got that underway and it's just carried on and on and on. And it's this, to me, uh, it's just those parallels um, have, have diverged and this is the time. And there seems to be a lot of people, at least from people I've been hearing from in our community that say, yeah, I, I want to know more about this. Mm -hmm. I think this is, this is the right time. And let's expand upon that a little bit when we talk about the political landscape and your mm -hmm. last comment, it's the right time. So, you know, we have, there's, there's theories out there in politics uh, that the pendulum, right, swings back and forth mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. So we have Barack Obama, and then theoretically the pendulum has swung the other way with mm -hmm. the current administration, um, where, uh, the world is waiting with bated breath to see who Joe Biden is going to pick as his mm. running mate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the list, he said it's going to be a woman. Uh, the list I was looking at, m most of them are women of color, mostly black. And then it's, it's I think some reports came out today saying that, that really he, he should be picking a black woman for all kinds of political reasons. And then we have the, a candidate for, here in Canada for the mm -hmm. Conservative nomination, mm -hmm. uh, Leslin Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it does feel like we're in an interesting time. Um, do you think the time is right? Let's start with, let's start here in Canada. Do you think the Conservatives are ready for a female <laughs> and a black female to, to lead the party and, 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 and what kind of considerations are, and I, I, I don't, we're, we don't need to get into heavy political analysis here. We're talking right. about as individuals, how, how we're feeling and, and this movement that is happening. There's very specific things that are going on right now, uh, maybe for a reason. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll speak first to the, um, Ms. Lewis and her, mm -hmm. her run for the conservative leadership. Um, have to hand it to her. I'm, I'm not a conservative, capital C conservative by any stretch, um, but I, I do have friends that are, um, you know, quite, quite conservative and have run for the party. Uh, I, I think that she is um, not only being you know, female, but a black female, I think she is incredibly brave. She has, um, I've read up a little bit on her. I know that she is, I think, a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I think she's a lawyer. Um, so she is used to 
uh, the, the debate and probably used to a fair bit of criticism and used to being in the public eye. And I think that, you know, I have to hand it to her. Why She's though? What, what's, what specifically is, is any more than any other political candidate? Because we could say that, I mean, politics is tough, whether it's Summerland or Canada or the US, right? Yes, uh, politics is a tough game, but I don't know her like at all. Um, but I see in her, like just watching her in her presentations and debate and things, I see in her um, a real go-getter and somebody who likes to step forward and accept a challenge. And that's, that's me. I'm never one to kind of back away. Um, and I, I admire her. I, I don't know, I, I see a, I see a like spirit in her or mm -hmm. something. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I feel like you've laid the table for me and now I have to ask, so oh. what, <laughs> what's next for you? I mean, you have a job right now, you're the mm -hmm. mayor and, and- And I love my job. You love, your, you're committed. But when you see women like Leslin and, and you see this momentum and this shift and you know, I touched briefly upon Joe Biden and I was kind of tongue in cheek when I said we're waiting with bated breath. Um, but does that start get you thinking up for the action? Well, you know, absolutely. Uh, I ran for provincial politics for the nomination in 2016. Yes, 2016, the election was in 2017. And, you know, within days of not winning the nomination, I thought, okay, well, you know, after I got over the, the bruising and the, the hurt, you know, um, I thought, okay, well, you know, I, what's, what's the next thing I can do? And I thought, well, never did finish my degree, so time to go back to school. And I found the Royal Roads Communications, and I absolutely loved, um, you know, the whole being a student again instead of being the instructor at the front of the class when I was working for Okanagan College. So. Uh, that was that, and uh, I had already decided that I was going to run for mayor, and so I did that. And um, I, I tend to get, even now, September is a very weird time for me. You know, I've been out of school for quite, quite a long time, and I mean, like a high school, I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and September rolls around and it's always, mm, you know, it, I, it's not necessarily time to get back to school, but it's something, I don't know if it's the change of the seasons or the change of the temperature, or as I see things start to get ready for winter, like nature get ready for winter, I'm not sure what it is. Um, but I'm always up for another challenge and that's the way I've lived my life. I've, I'm, well, I think I could be described as type A and fair, <laughs> fairly competitive. Um, but, you know, uh, my, uh, my sons are just um, so, so supportive. Um, my husband, who's here tonight, he just so supportive and uh, like, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, I've made up my mind, so, you know, let's, let's do everything that we can to do whatever it happens to be. And you're right, it's very um, inspiring and encouraging to see other women step into what can sometimes be a bit of a nasty arena, um, especially someone of color. Mm -hmm. uh, the voices like voices unheard, <laughs> it gives uh, the opportunity to give a different perspective, 
um, even from a male perspective to a female perspective, there there are differences in uh, all kinds of aspects. You know how we parent, how we learn, how we how we govern, how we create policy, how we prioritize all kinds of different aspects. So I think it's really important to have more of a diverse. Um, cross-section of, of people in government. Now, in local government, in Summerland, hmm, not sure how long it'll be, <laughs> but um, the, you know, there's one of us and that's a start, right? Yeah. So uh, as anyone who's listening here tonight and they're thinking, I don't have anything to offer, um, so a woman or a woman of color, mm -hmm. and thinking about politics might be something they might want to do. What's your advice to them? Come and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk to, to anyone, uh, you know, um, really any age. I've spoken to high school age kids and um, really the interest can get started there. Um, although I never envisioned when I was a kid uh, being you know in the political realm myself like as a politician certainly i remember you know some pretty incredible incidents when i was growing up um just watching my parents um mm -hmm. reaction my mom's reaction to the um, assassination of john f kennedy and and yes i was i was <laughs> alive then <laughs> um but it was it was a profound reaction to that. She, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm adopted. I'm one of um, nine children that were adopted, and they have one of their own. Um, and both of my parents are white white parents. Uh, so, is seeing that reaction, and I wasn't very old, but I still remember her saying. Oh no! That this is a horrible thing for um, for black people in the United States. You know this the civil rights movement and and all of that. And um, you know that was that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, the struggles are still very real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But getting back to your question, I would love to see. Um, more, more women, more females in, um, or people that identify as female, um, in uh, all level, all levels of government. Um, but I would also like to see, and this gets back to the diversity thing. Um, you know, indigenous people, black mm -hmm. people, people of color. Um, you know, people that are part of the 2S LGBTQ plus community, uh, all of those, all different uh, abilities, all of that. Because if we are, if we are expected to govern for the people, then the people need to be recognized in government. I feel pretty strongly about that. Thank you. I, I, uh, I think we can end on that. Some pretty powerful and important statements from Tony Boot, Mayor of Summerland. Thank you so much for Thank joining you, us Jessica. here this evening. And you heard her. If you're interested, look yeah. her up. Contact yeah. her. She'll guide you along the way. Mayor at Summerland.ca. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you once again for joining us, uh, those of you online and those of you here at the Canada Conference uh, Hotel here in Kelowna, one of our sponsors, as well as Kelowna Pride and Castanet Media. We will see you right back here next Tuesday.